This episode of the Multiamory Podcast is brought to you by Quip, modern oral care delivered. For a free toothbrush head refill, go to tryquip.com slash multiamory. If 25% of people and like 30 something percent of people in the like 18 to 24 demographic use online dating or have used online dating, what would you say that is for polyamorous people or other like consensually non-monogamous people? 80%. I guess 90 Nine, oh wow! Like the percentage of the consensually non-monogamous population right. that is using online dating yeah, exactly. actively or has has a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> anecdotally, it feels like the majority, right? Right, and I and I think that that's an interesting thing that none of these studies take into account. Of course, which which is interesting. Why would they? If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about dating. Actually, we're mostly talking about online dating. Mm. This is something that people ask us about a lot. It's something that a lot of people struggle with. And it's also something that a lot of people put information about out online. Mm. And instead of focusing on the same crap that everyone else does, this episode is going to be focused on how to maintain your well-being and your peace of mind and wellness while doing online dating. And in other words, how to rise above the game rather than just trying to game the system better. Mm, I like that. I like that. I do want to know, like, can we just do a quick survey of like, what is all the same crap that tends to get covered in other arenas online? You know, it's stuff like, oh, well, people find it more attractive if you don't smile in your photos. So, like, don't put smiling photos. Is that true? I, that is... Wasn't there... A, that is one of the stats that gets thrown out there. Was it do do photos with other people or don't do photos with other people? Don't do photos with other people who are more attractive than you. Yes. Um, right. It's just <laughs> this, this ridiculous, terrible? like, super surface level bullshit. Bullshit. I, I was also reading mm. some like ridiculous stuff when I was doing research for this episode about like, you know, if you put love in your profile, you're more likely to find someone to marry. What? Or yeah, what? Yeah, if you use the word love in your profile, and that like, I love going on wa- long walks on the beach. R- right. Whatever. It's marriage material right there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. It's just. Just the the level of just ridiculousness of some of the advice out there that supposedly is backed by science is just like absurd. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're going to get it into is, that I, a little bit. I do just have to like call some attention to it, how fascinating it is, how much online dating has changed just in the last even 10 years or so. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Because I mean, think about it like, 10 plus years ago, you know, we didn't have any apps, like no one had a smartphone really Mm -hmm. that they were using all the time. Um, And so it was just kind of like websites. And I think websites still had this reputation of being like kind of skeezy, Mm. I guess. Or just embarrassing that you were using them. Embarrassing. In order to date that you had to do so. That that was embarrassing. I mean, match.com... I feel like that's been around forever. It has. Yeah, it's about 200 years yeah. old. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, just some statistics I did find is that um, just based on how many people are actually doing online dating, <coughs> that it's, I think it's around 25% of people. And wow. when you look at specifically the like 18 to 25 demographic, it's like 36% or something. It's like okay. a very significant portion. And didn't you find... Big chunk. Of people. And didn't you find something like people marry more quickly when they're dating online or is that even true there was a so study we'll, that we'll get that. into that yeah. later actually we'll yeah. talk about that in our bonus content all um, right but okay let's dive into like as we said we get a lot of people who reach out to us asking questions about 
dating whether and usually it's specifically focused on like how do I find partners who are like okay being Mm non-monogamous but it's not necessarily always that um or people who like you know send us their dating profiles and like kind of want to get feedback and stuff on that um and I I just like online dating while I have to say from my own personal experience um I feel like has been quote-unquote successful for me because you know pretty much all of my current partners that I'm with I met online Mm -hmm. and it's so no funny to think so you met far. Jace Knock online. On <laughs> um, <laughs> it's amazing that you met but, Jace online to me. Yeah. But however, however, uh, at the same time, like online dating caused a lot of pain and frustration mm-hmm. for, I mean, not only myself, definitely caused a lot of pain and frustration for me, but for a lot of people who reach out to us, who reach out to me in my coaching practice. Um, And so I guess, you know, we kind of wanted to cover like some of the most common pitfalls and common frustrations that seem to come up for people when they are trying to date or take part in any kind of online dating or things like that. And of course, I think the number one is just people getting really discouraged Mm -hmm. after a while, Um, whether it's, you know, you send out a ton of messages and you very rarely get a response or you're inundated with messages, but mostly from people that like you're really not interested in or people ghost you or you do go on dates with people and it just doesn't pan out or doesn't, you know, doesn't seem to work out. Like, and this is the thing is that like the frustration and the discouragement is true across the board. You know, I know that when we talk about online dating specifically, often it gets very gendered and talking about the very different gendered experiences, Mm -hmm. um, which is not necessarily false. However, the pain and the frustration and the discouragement is something that everyone experiences. It's not just, you know, one particular group of people or another. Yeah. Another particular challenge that people have is if you are in some kind of consensually non-monogamous relationship and your partner is either getting a lot more interest or more messages or maybe just better messages while you're getting a lot of garbage mm-hmm. messages. Like, the, you know, there's whatever it is where there's some kind of imbalance um, and that kind of like envy of the other person's experience, which to you seems better than your own. Yeah. Whether it actually is or not. And I think uh, when you are dating online, you're definitely going to get rejected a lot. Um, and perhaps even when you're dating just in real life, you might get rejected and that may be a little bit more challenging because, you know, you're face to face with the person. If you go on a first date with someone and then, you know, at the end of the day, they're like, "Uh, I don't know if I really want to see you again. Sorry, we just didn't click. I don't feel compatible with you. Um, But you may get kind of like micro rejections all over the place online. And perhaps that's kind of less painful in the moment, but it can sort of add up over time. Um, And you talked about the ghosting for a second, Mm Jace. And yeah, I mean, like one time I remember there was somebody, it it was one of the first women that I I messaged online and we hit it off for a while, but then all of a sudden she kind of just ghosted me and said like, sorry, like I'm not going to do this. And I felt really, really rejected and really, really sad about it. Um, So I think that it can still mean a lot to a person, even if it is just online with that barrier of, the computer there or the app there or whatever, it still can like elicit like a very sad negative response. Yeah. It's so funny. And I feel like even, you know, even if like, like let's say you mash with someone and you're talking and even before like being super interested in this person or even knowing if you want to go on a date with this person, even if you're ghosted at that point, like it still can bring up all these like self-directed conspiracy theories of like, did I say something? Did Did they notice something in my profile? Mm -hmm. Did, uh, or did they find someone just much more interesting? Like all these questions that you're never going to get the answer to. And, And so it's like, even when you don't have an emotional attachment to someone yet, or even much of an interest in someone yet, it can still, I think I like the, you know, Emily used that word micro rejection. <laughs> like I yeah. think it can still create this little sting that does build up over time. Yeah. And I think because of that, because, you know, dating and online dating in general exposes us to a lot of rejection on, you know, a wide scale, people can start to get really obsessed with like trying to figure out the formula. I think because sometimes it feels, it feels it initially feels arbitrary to people 
And I think that's why people want to try to figure out the formula because initially it's like, oh, like I messaged this person, they messaged me back, seemed like we were hitting it off. It all seemed great. And then they disappeared. What the heck? I must have done something wrong. I need to figure out the right way to do it. I need Mm. to figure out the right formula. And so people can then get really obsessed with, for instance, like the minutia on their dating profile, um, you know, like really, really getting particular around, well, what if I phrase this this way? You know, I mean, it calls to mind, Jace, like what you're saying at the top of it, like this idea of like, oh, if you sprinkle in this word, but not that word, yeah. you know, or if you use this kind of picture, but not that kind of picture. Um, and it calls to mind um, something that we call in the gaming community, um, mm-hmm. min-maxing, which, you know, all our nerdy gamer listeners out there will know what min-maxing is. But for those of us, uh, those of you that um, aren't familiar with that term, min-maxing is this idea of like, essentially trying usually in a video game context, it's like trying to make your character or your build like as efficient as possible. So kind of like making it not necessarily for what's going to be the most fun for you or the most joyful, but just what's going to be like the most sufficient and is like going to be able to win or cause the most damage or whatever. Um, and to be fair, like I think some people do get some joy out of min maxing, but, but, um, very particular people. And so I think when it comes to a dating profile, like people can really, really get obsessed with the idea of like, if I can just figure out the formula here, mm. then it's all going to work out, which yeah. is also another process that can just really drive you in circles, essentially. Yeah. So segueing from that, from these sort of common frustrations, we wanted to talk about some actual statistics about online dating. And this first part is very related to that last <laughs> thing about trying to min-max, trying to figure out the formula for like... Like I said, like, should I smile? Should I have tigers in my photos? Should I, what? <laughs> you know, oh, good Lord. <laughs> well, okay. Hang on, Jace, before you continue. <laughs> I mean, you can't really say anything until you've done a study where you have tigers in all of your dating photos and then you see right. what level of success it generates in all you. of them i mean can you imagine people are just like okay i gotta ask like what's <laughs> with the tigers in like, every single photo these, are you you know like a tiger do you own a tiger conservatory like what is happening here <laughs> i Good love that idea, I, think, I think in pickup artist terms that's known as peacocking mm-hmm. yeah. oh, I, or, I think that's related to peacocking yeah, like doing something like tigers. really big and flamboyant and noticeable in right. order yeah. to, to get, get attention. attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so what I'm getting to here is in doing research about this, the, the, the biggest fact I came away with <laughs> was the fact that the studies and research about online dating are fucking garbage. Mm-hmm. Like they are literally, literally figuratively pieces of shit, <laughs> awful, <laughs> terrible studies. I'm like, I, I know I'm being very emphatic about this, but really fucking horrible. And what I mean by horrible is bad research methods, um, results that that seem to say something that might not Mm. based in a lot of assumptions, a lot of very small sample sizes or very like badly put together ways of collecting this data. Um, so some of those things out there about, you know, um, different types of pictures that people find attractive or certain words that are more effective in profiles and things like that. It's not that those things don't have some truth to them, but they're either taken out of context or are in this very limited sample size in terms of like ages of people or sexual orientations or genders, or even just Mm. the fact that all of these studies are so focused on cisgender monogamous relationships Mm -hmm. too to the point that i feel like they're not even useful for people who are cisgender and monogamous um, because they just go in with too many assumptions about what success means um what what people are looking for a lot of gender assumptions there's just like so many problems that really like finding even halfway decent studies was a huge challenge um specifically like studies that measure the success of certain things in online dating. It's like, wh- how do you determine success? Right. I mean, that was going to be my question is like, what does count as success? Is it number you of dates married. you end up going on? Is it ending up in a particular type of relationship? It's usually is it just getting receiving married. messages? Mm. Usually the really? studies it's getting married or going on a date, like depending on going what, on a what date. That's a, that's, a, that's a wide gap in 
in goalposts. Right. Cause it, cause yeah, like if you're a site like eHarmony hiring corporate shills like Helen Fisher to do your research, then you're going to want to find statistics about marriage. Like that's right. You know, that's what you're going to look for. And that's going to be your metric for success. And so everything's going to be based around efficiency of getting to a marriage, not about the happiness of the marriage, not about the long-term well-being of the people in that marriage. Mm. It's just about getting to the goal of being married. And then on the other hand, there's the ones that are the studies about just like the success of a profile Mm -hmm. in terms of getting messages or getting responses or the success of messages getting responses or getting to the point of a first date. That's just, it's like, what's the metric? And all of them are bad for different reasons. Interesting. Hmm. So, okay. Speaking of messages, this was another statistic that we found because, okay, obviously I feel like when Jace and I at the same time were doing OkCupid, we're on OkCupid, Uh I would get a ton of messages. Most of them were like, sup, or something. This is also back back in the day before OkCupid did their big revamp. That's true. And switched kind of a more Tinder swipey swipey style when it was more like traditional dating site. Well, they had the Tinder swipey swipey there, but it wasn't like the main thing. But you could just message anyone. Yes, you could just message anyone. So yeah, I guess it was a little bit different, but yes, like, but overall what I'm saying is that like, I got far more messages, I think, than you did at the time. By far. Absolutely. But so this is interesting, this statistic saying that like the best that you can hope for when you send out a message is a 20% response rate. And but that's like the best of the best. The best of the best of the best. But and most the, people... Or the luckiest of the luckiest or the yeah, most whatever. privileged of the most privileged yeah, or whatever exactly. it is. Exactly. Whatever you want to call it and whatever it probably is, which yes, privilege and all of those things do apply. But it, most people, just the, the vast majority of people, it's going to be a 10% response li- rate or lower, which is interesting. So... I mean, and I get that even, yes, if I sent out messages, I wouldn't often get them back. It wouldn't often happen like that. No, me neither. I think, you know, back in the days when I was on OkCupid, I made a lot of assumptions myself thinking like, well, well, I'll get a ton. I'm whatever. Exactly. I have a ton of messages. And so clearly if I, you know, take the initiative to like message someone I'm attracted to, then surely like it'll be no problem. And yeah, like I like, never got messages back when exactly. I would message people. And that was, yeah. that was an ego blow. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. What the hell is happening? <laughs> but yeah, there it's was. so hard. It's hard not to create a story around it. Oh, for sure. It's really not easy. Like, yeah. 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 It's really too bad. So, However, um, some other interesting figures that we found when researching this is that, I mean, okay, here's the thing, is that like fundamentally the majority of online dating places are fundamentally like looksist and racist and ableist. Like it reflects much of the internet as it is today, unfortunately. Um, However, they did find, at least as far as when it came to people's looks, that people found a wider variety of people attractive as in like a wider variety of looks, a wider variety of the way people look, the way their body looked, the way their body was shaped, um, a much wider range people found attractive when they were also exposed to a person's positive personality traits Mm. in a profile, as opposed to when they were just looking at a lineup of people's pictures, you know, that like when they were just exposed to people's pictures, it became, I think, kind of the similar bottom of the barrel, very typical human nature on a lot of online dating sites, which is just like go to the most attractive person possible or mm-hmm. most conventionally attractive person possible. Mm-hmm. However, they did find that like when people had more of a sense of this person's actual personality, um, then they were more likely to find, again, like this wider range of body types and face types and things like that to be attractive. Um, and that's something that we are going to come back to a little bit later on um, in talking about like essentially how to function within uh, a dynamic that is extremely like looksism based. Yeah. And so there are also these algorithms for each of these dating sites to kind of try to whittle down a bunch of people from like the thousands and thousands and thousands of people on these sites. Mm-hmm. And the algorithms whittle them down so that you maybe are left with 10 or something. Or well, even, usually, or usually even like more than that. 30. But... I mean, even 30, but it's like far less, obviously, than the thousands that are out there. 
Yes. Well, but that's the thing, though, is that like all of these sites, you know, whether it's Mash.com or eHarmony or OkCupid, like all of them talk about having like a matching algorithm. That's yes. what they call it. They call it a matching algorithm. Exactly. That's, like, we're trying to match you with particular people that we think that you're going to be compatible with. But the thing is that like research shows that like that's not actually what it's doing. It is literally just, just that. It is that. literally just yes. trying to give you fewer options so you don't get overwhelmed. It's not necessarily an indicator of like you're going to be super mega compatible with this person. Yeah, it, it was Correct. interesting. There was this like a uh, group of psychologists who were asked to write a report on this. And their conclusion was that the matching algorithms don't actually show anything about how compatible you're actually going to be with this person. They might show some things, right? Like shared interests or, you know, certain surface level things, but just that they basically were like the science that has been done about actual compatibility in relationships is not being applied to these. Mm -hmm. um, and I pulled out this quote because I really enjoyed it. Um, but one of the authors of this report said, um, if, if I were giving a report card to the dating sites in the comment section of the report card, I would write, apply yourself <laughs> to basically <laughs> feel like there is research out there. You're not using it. Instead, you're just using markety buzzword stuff. So I have to ask the two of you. So, okay. So knowing all those sits and stats about online dating, which I feel like a lot of these contradict a lot of our assumptions about online dating. What, what's the main takeaway for us there? From these stits and stats? Yeah. Just not take it all so seriously. Mm. Well, and you're probably not going to like find, I mean, maybe you'll find the one if that's what you're looking for on these dating sites. But it probably just, you know, it, it's a crapshoot either way. If you're just meeting someone out in the wild or if you're meeting them on a dating profile that, you know, regardless of the algorithms and regardless of the, the way in which you present yourself on these sites, mm -hmm. you may or may not have a good time with them. It's just a crapshoot. Well, so deal with it <laughs> like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard on some of these, they the kind of summary people would make from it is like actually meeting people in real life, like finding a way to like meet up for a coffee or whatever is better than just spending all your time trying to analyze profiles or look at match percentages or adjust your profile. Because in the end, these algorithms aren't really the magic that they <coughs> claim to be. I mm -hmm. thought that one was interesting. Right. However, something that I tried very hard to find statistics about, and they just don't exist. No one's studying it because there's not money in it, probably, um, is about specifically the consensually non-monogamous community. And if, okay, I'm actually curious to hear what you guys think, because I was trying to estimate this when I was talking with my dad earlier today about this. If 25% of people and like 30-something percent of people in the like 18 to 24 demographic use online dating or have used online dating, what would you say that is for polyamorous people or other like consensually non-monogamous people? 80%. I guess 90. Nin oh, wow. Like the percentage of the consensually non-monogamous population right. that is using online dating yeah, exactly. actively or has? Has. A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, sure, <laughs> anecdotally, it feels like the majority, right? Right, and I, and I think that that's an interesting thing that none of these studies take into account. Of course. Which, which is interesting. Why would that, they? Right. It's not something on most people's radar. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's an interesting question, because I think that is something that could change some of this. I think it should. Well, um, and, yeah, I mean, it would just give us so much more information. I... There, I cannot tell you the amount of times where I'm like, I want them to do a study on this regarding non-monogamous <laughs> populations, yeah. but there isn't any. And they are like maybe seemingly trivial things, but there are so many seemingly trivial studies out there like about just random ass shit. And I want to know all that <laughs> random ass shit regarding the consensually non-monogamous community. Yeah. Well, it really would be just great just to get a lot of like the more famous studies about relationships and communication and sex just to be redone, including people who are, you know, mm. transgender or asexual or not heterosexual or, or non-monogamous or whatever, just to get 
a broader scope of a broader sense of, you know, how it is that we conduct ourselves in relationships and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I also yeah. thought that um, like with the matching algorithm thing, that one I did think was like, well, if you're thinking of a site like OkCupid, where you can actually indicate that you are non-monogamous or monogamous, I would say that if, if you're a, like including that in part of the algorithm, I'd say that would actually be huge and would make you more likely to find people who are compatible with you in that way. Again, it's not necessarily about how you'll get along in a relationship, but I do think that is a very useful thing. And I think that's mm -hmm. why so many people who are non-monogamous use online dating because mm -hmm. you at yeah. least get past that where already if roughly four to five percent of the population in the U S is non-monogamous, that's all, you know, you're already setting yourself up with the odds against you. If you're just meeting random people mm -hmm. at a bar. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I think that's, true. that's worth taking into account with all of this. If you are part of some specific sub community of the greater pool. So I feel like in talking about those things, the takeaway that I get is this idea that like online dating is a tool, although it is an imperfect tool, but that's okay. And, but because it's an imperfect tool, that's why it's really important to talk about the ways to maintain your well being while you're online, while you're making a profile or sorting through a billion other profiles to maintain your well being while you are going on dates with people, as well as maintain your well being when you're not going on dates with people, just when you're in this whole process of dating in order to make yourself, you know, be peaceful and happy even while using this imperfect tool that can often lead you to feel rejected and on this emotional roller coaster. <laughs> um, but anyway, before we get into that, we're going to take a quick break to talk about our Patreon community. So if you go to patreon.com slash multi-amory, you can become part of our Patreon community, which has become this really, really amazing group of people that have kind of come up around this podcast and um, enveloped it like... <laughs> a velvet <laughs> or maybe a mink fur anyway oh uh, that wasn't the image not oh vegan, sorry not mink a fake, mink a fake a fur. vegan yeah, can we, mink can fur we, thank you yes <laughs> yes not that's exactly an, what i mean not hurt those animals out there anyway all silliness aside seriously though our patreon community is full of these like fantastic amazing people who take part in our monthly video discussion groups who take part in our private discourse forum in our private facebook discussion group um and it's just this really wonderful, supportive community of people. People find that they're comfortable enough to post about what's going on in their life or if they're going through a breakup or if they're going through this, if they're dealing with online dating and trying to handle the burnout and where they can really reach out for advice and for support and for silly memes as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, There's actually been some discussion recently about kind of wanting support about online dating, like those sorts of struggles and just feeling discouraged and reminding yeah. each other to take care of yourself and to, you know, right. promote your well being. So it's it's really right. cool to get to talk to people about that. Yeah. We also do often have people who will post, for instance, their OkCupid profile mm -hmm. in the group and be like, hey, can I get some feedback on this? Or what do you think? Do you feel like I'm doing this right? Or do you feel like my pictures are, you know, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you want to take part in that, um, you can go to patreon.com slash multiamory to sign up and become part of our awesome community. Yeah. And something else that is actually incredibly helpful and hopefully will help you as well as us is to take a moment, take a couple minutes to write us a review on iTunes or on Stitcher. And the reason why this is helpful is that it helps our show to high up to helps our show to show up <laughs> higher in search results. And it helps people to understand what they're going to get from the show and what they might benefit from it. If they're monogamous, is there something in this for them? If they're single, is there something in it for them? Like whatever your experience with the show has been, sharing that will help other people to get it. And the way that this, or, you know, to try it out and the way this benefits you is the fact that the more people who are getting this information, hopefully means there will be more honest people who actually want to have healthy relationships and who focus their lives on that for then for you to date. Uh, in addition to having your super secret bat signal, which is your multi emery merch that you can wear so people can go, oh, I see, you wear that logo too. That must mean you care about these things. Let's be friends or more. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you want to promise that, Chase. Gosh. Then it might, it might happen. 
It has happened. Okay, it yeah, has I'm happened. Sure, You're, sure, you know what? Sure. It has. It has. Yeah. So we we are also the multi amory dating service. <laughs> unofficially, 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 yeah. but it it yeah. has happened. Um, and finally, our sponsor for this week is Quip. I I just wanted to shout out to Quip that they kind of revamped their new uh toothpaste it, it's like a minty toothpaste i haven't gotten the new one yet yeah well i have and it it was already great but now it's even better it's more <laughs> i was gonna say i actually more, really enjoyed their existing toothpaste i, know, I but can't it's, even imagine it's more more minty and just like really lovely <laughs> i do like mintiness that's yeah true. i love the more more minty um <laughs> But uh, basically, Quip is this incredible company that it makes like sexy designer toothbrushes that are like kind of uh, not as expensive as your Sonicare might be, but still does an amazing job cleaning your teeth. It still is an electric toothbrush, but with a battery. So it's a lot sleeker in its design. Um, it's great for traveling. The three of us travel a ton. So I love taking my quip with me on all of the trips that I go on. And I know that these two hooligans do as well. Um, But if you use tryquip.com slash multiamory, then you'll get $10 off. You will essentially like get a free head refill. So $10 off, which counts as your free head. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we still never figured out a way to do this ad without, without. having to say the words free head yeah. and <laughs> what else to say uh, except we'll for out quip is gonna give you some free head right so you honestly don't... the way that we talk about it i would think people would maybe believe it <laughs> so yeah so the, the, just to clarify yeah yeah yeah. it's a free you, like you, you pay the normal head. price for the toothbrush at first yeah but your first refill for a new head and battery for and it is tooth- free. And, and toothpaste, toothpaste and travel free. toothpaste. Yeah. Is free. <laughs> so that's a lot of stuff. It's even better than free head. Even better. Well, we can debate that one. You well, know? I, you know what? I might, you know, because free head, it's like, okay, one, you know, block of time of but feeling this is good. Three but this is three worth. months of feeling great in your mouth. Yeah. Every night and yeah. morning, right? Like, what's not like. Much That's not true. To love. It is a lot more time. Yeah. Okay. So if you right, want to okay, get your right, sexy, if you want to get your sexy, sleek quip and variety of colors, I yeah, my partner and I each have one, and I love looking at it. Yesterday, some of our patrons <laughs> came over and hung out with us. Oh, really? And nice. they were like, "See your quip in the bathroom," and I'm like, "Uh huh, uh-huh. duh." <laughs> yep. And uh, yeah, so if you want to get in on that train, then go to tryquip.com/slash multiamory and get that free head. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. To well, the on that note, um, so jeez, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got to get like all the free head vibes yeah. out. Okay, yeah. back to online dating. Online dating. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So I think it's really important to talk about first and foremost, before, you know, before having the conversation around how to make a successful profile or before having the conversation around like how to pick out the right pictures, I think really the most important conversation to have with yourself is about like, how do I take care of myself during this process? Because like in my opinion, that's going to be the thing that dictates how this whole thing goes for you essentially, because like I've seen so many people that go into the online dating process and just like emotionally get mangled and spat out on the other side and are just like, fuck this. That was terrible. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about right now. And again, to reiterate that like the online dating marketplace, cause it is a marketplace, which sounds so mercenary, but it is what it is. But it does reflect a lot of behavior on the internet, which is that it is ableist. It is racist. It's luxist. And if you are not privileged in any of those areas, the experience of using online dating sites or using apps, even the experience just by itself can be upsetting. And so that's why it's really important to prioritize your mental and your emotional health in this context. So the first thing that you can do is to mindfully swipe as opposed to just like going through, you know, first reaction, like, okay, I like this person or I don't. And then just automatically swiping left or right. Is it still left or right in OkCupid? Yeah. Is it the exact they same must thing? Have, because they know people have maintained the same habits. <laughs> Muscle from memory. Tinder, so oh, not, I see. Yeah, they're not going to mess up on that. I don't think. I think Bumble's the same way. So swiping right is you like the person. Swiping left is all pass. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
Okay, so instead of doing that, like just, you know, gut reaction, first person that you see, you're like, okay, left or right, maybe try to slow things down a bit. Try to like figure out your emotional state when you see this person. Because again, it's just it's just a picture. I mean, yikes, that's difficult to really ascertain potentially like what you actually think. But like, what does your body feel like in the moment? Do you get a, I don't know, a tingling sensation, <laughs> an excitement perhaps when you see that person? And maybe th- think about that or or feel it and then give the person a chance. Like, don't just go left or right, like, whatever I feel in the moment, let's do this. Like, take some time with it, perhaps. It's almost like you look at it like a chore of like, I have to get through mm. as many as I can in the short yeah. amount of time I have on this bus ride or like so whatever it is. So many people do that, though. Yeah. yeah, they just will sit there and they'll be like, okay, I'm going to go on a like Tinder right now and swipe left or right. And then mm-hmm. they'll do that for like an hour. And I mean, I've definitely been guilty of no, it. I mean, it's like, no, I mean, I hear you. Yeah. It is this like addictive process even though i i feel like the process itself doesn't bring me a ton of joy but there is still something very addictive about it it's 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 almost like checking things off of a to-do list it's a little bit like playing a lottery or a slot machine because every now and then you matched with this person yeah and that happens interesting not very often. And you feel but so good when you do. You get that dopamine rush. It's exactly the same addictive Jeez, mechanism it's like a of gambling. gambling. It's yeah, it's gambling specifically. Yeah, Jesus. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take oh. a sidebar to tell you about a little study with birds. There was a study what? excuse me. There was a study done with birds where they would push a lever in their cage and food would come out. And <clears throat> they had an option where uh you had to like hit the lever three times and like every third time the bird hit it a pellet of food would come out that they could eat. And then they had another one where it was random. Sometimes it'd be on the third one. Sometimes it would be a couple in a row. Sometimes Mm. there might be 10 between when some food would come out. And then at some point food stops coming out of it. The birds who got it regularly every third one would keep trying it for a certain amount of time and then eventually stop. And the birds who got it randomly kept doing it basically forever. Like they never gave up because of the addictiveness the yeah. of an unpredictable reward. Right. right. <sighs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's yeah. like those, uh, the scratchers cards that you get and you can like see the, they have those little scanners that like you can see if it's a winner or not. And it's so e- they're like, they're so cheap. You can just like go back and keep getting them, keep getting them. Cause maybe you'll get a winner. Right. And if you get it right. just often enough, exactly. Then you'll be back forever. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, seriously. I think it is interesting to talk about, like, I think a part of mindful swiping or mindful online dating is also making note of, like, when you choose to open a dating app. Like, mm. is it mostly, like, late at night before bed or mm. when I'm drunk or when I'm tired oh, or geez. when I'm feeling yeah. sad? And again, I say that because, like, totally been guilty of basically all of the above. <laughs> yep. You know, that, like... And I think, yeah, like, I think paying attention to your context as well of when you choose to kind of start swiping or start using a dating app is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like Emily was saying, the idea too of like asking, like, what are you feeling rather than just, is this a yes or no? Because then regardless of which you pick, you're learning stuff about yourself Mm. of being like, huh, this is interesting. Like I'm noticing I react this certain way to a certain type of picture or a certain type of person. I wonder why that is. Like, is that something I could mm. maybe examine about myself? And yeah. Maybe I mean, how often do we ask ourselves those questions? Rarely ever. Imagine that, that right. Tinder could be like a mindfulness tool. Whoa. Rather than just, <laughs> you should market a lottery. that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what are some other ways that you can do this more mindfully? (laughs) Okay, so going along with that is something that I found that I had to do for myself, which is to limit um, the amount of time that I spend browsing profiles. Uh, This for me was specifically with OkCupid. I imagine this would apply on Tinder as well. Um, But it was, you know, this could be a very specific, like I'm going to do it for this amount of time on these days and that's it. And the rest of the time I'm not going to, obsess over it and think about it, like maybe respond to messages, but I'm not going to sit there like combing through people's profiles and analyzing my messages and trying to compose the best message. Um, 
that, or it could be something a little more general of just like, as soon as I start to feel myself going into that place of kind of like comparing myself to this imagined person that I think would get a good response or, you know, the person I think that they would be into or to the place of like, I don't really like the things this person wrote, but like, I don't know, maybe it'd be fine. Mm. It, you know, like whatever it is where I found myself to start compromising on something, whether it was my self-esteem or my better judgment or whatever it was, then it was like, nope, I just got to stop. Like, this isn't, this isn't like a deadline that needs to get finished. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So in your actual online dating profile, when it's in OkCupid thing, because I know Tinder like is limits you to only a, two sentences or something some number of characters i forget how much yeah but when you do have more space i guess to talk about yourself and talk about your likes and dislikes and all of that stuff i think less is more Mm -hmm. um it's been shown that yeah you shouldn't write a novel in your profile don't just like go on and on and on and on and on because probably people aren't going to read all of it anyways (laughs) but you know not too little but just the right amount. It's the Goldilocks, the Goldilocks of yeah. profiles. Exactly. Thank Jeez, you. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, don't go overboard. Just less is more potentially. But also you want people to hear about you. You want people to kind of figure out who you are from your profile if you can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And something else to bear in mind is, you know, especially when you're swiping people, if you're looking through other people's profiles, the attractiveness of someone's pictures is not really a very good measure of what your actual compatibility or chemistry is going to be with them. And I can definitely attest, like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, in my personal experience, like the people that I've dated who are like the, the most conventional attractive, um, I like, I just, I don't know, after dating a number of both conventionally attractive and maybe like less conventionally attractive people or whatever, Emily's pointing at Jace and I, Jace, I do think you're quite attractive, but, <laughs> but you're not the most attractive. No, oh I'm my kidding. goodness. No, I, how do I not bury myself it's in too my late. Grave just keep right going. Now? <laughs> no, I, okay. No, this is what I'm like. This is my thing. I was thinking more of like the times that I've dated the like very traditional, like, beefcake muscle boy chiseled jaw um toxic masculine man (laughs) essentially i'm sure not all of who you are those men who are beefcake yes no i'm I'm not all of them are terrible but i'm just saying that it's like in my personal experience it's not been a good track record it's like like just because i'm super attracted to a person does not mean that they're like the one or that it's all going to work out or that it's we're all going to be compatible have i talked my way out of this yet i really don't <laughs> yeah feel like i'm just trying to remember like the beefcake chisel uh, boys that you have dated and i can't think of any <laughs> <laughs> It's because it didn't last long. Okay, that must, so. that must be why. That must be why. I think something that, that uh, <laughs> gosh, uh, something that I identified for myself when trying to be a little bit more mindful about, like, what is it that I'm drawn to about the profiles that I am? Honestly, what I realized for myself is it was about the quality of their photos and not <laughs> even about them of necessarily. Of course it would be. It would it, also be like the yeah, quality of be, their hair. I was just going to say Yes, that. I know and you so hair. well. Yeah. that For me, it's like the quality of their haircut and color and then the quality of the photo. And I was like, neither of these are actually good indicators of whether I will Those have chemistry with this person. just your and your skills. I know. But that's, but that's how, oh my gosh, how many conversations you and I have had about that? You're like, you know, her face, I, I like it, but I don't know about the haircut. I don't know. I don't know about the color. I don't know. <laughs> well, okay. That actually leads into my next point, which is that like, there's a lot that goes into attraction and what we're drawn to and averse to outside of just surface level, how we perceive someone's, you know, uh, physical qualities, essentially. There's things like socialization, you know, because all of us are raised in a particular culture where we've been taught this particular body type or face type is attractive and this body type is not. And so there's a lot of socialization that we kind of have to wade through. Um, 
Part of attraction can be the perceived status that we think that this person would give us. Either we perceive that it's like, oh, maybe they're very successful in their job or they make a lot of money. And so we're attracted to the idea that being with them would bring us status. Or Mm -hmm. this is someone who is like very conventionally attractive by everyone's standards. And so if we were with this person, that would bring me status because of me having such like a beautiful or handsome partner. Um, And again, just how we think that other people would perceive this particular partner really affects our kind of surface level attraction, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, because I think like there's a lot of people out there who are attracted to a wide variety of body types, a wide variety of gender identities, but because of like the stigma around dating a particular body type or dating a particular gender or dating a particular, you know, whatever, that really does influence the decisions that people make on dating apps. And so I think part of this whole mindful swiping, like mindful online dating thing is like, I really encourage people to like try to deconstruct that shit, (laughs) you know, like when you are swiping, like if you're swiping left on someone, it can be a really interesting exercise to just pause and literally just kind of feel into yourself and inquire like, why am I swiping left Mm. on this person? And it doesn't mean that like you shouldn't, like it's okay. Like maybe there is something that like really is a deal breaker for you or whatever, but it's like, but just inquiring as to why, and inquiring where that came from is a really, really illuminating exercise. Yeah. And it's possible to do if you're sitting there swiping slowly instead of just, you know, kind of mindlessly going back and forth. Mm-hmm. So we're going to transition a little bit. I think a lot of this still is very related to actually the process of messaging and putting together a profile and all of this. But these ones will also apply to actually going on dates or messaging with people, right? In anticipation right. of going on dates. And so this is about maintaining your well-being and your sense of like being at peace during that process. So the first one here is when you're messaging or with when you're on a date with someone in person is to go in and sort of check in with yourself throughout to have a focus on, I want to learn about who this person is. I want to get to understand a little bit about them rather than going in with, I want to impress them with my best stories. Mm. Mm. And similarly, this, this is from a, um, an article by a, a psychologist who wrote an article about kind of going on dates. He said to turn your dial from find soulmate to get to know this person or have a good conversation. And I was like, yeah, I like that idea of like thinking about I'm, I'm calibrating what my goals are and what my intentions are going into this conversation, whether it's still in messages or actually on the date. Mm. Just like, I actually just want to understand this person as much as I can, because that is going to be more useful to me, both in the short term, as well as the long term. And also many studies have shown, um, and anecdotal evidence that being a good listener, like actually actively listening and paying attention to someone else will make other people think you are more interesting. Which goes against a lot of what people assume is like, I have to impress them, impress them with stuff about myself. But in reality, the people who are often thought of as the most interesting are the ones who just listen better. Mm. Wow. That is really that's interesting. Cool. Yeah. Huh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a I, classic Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people thing. No, <laughs> well, seriously. It's Dale, just like, listen I guess that to makes people, sense. ask yeah. them questions, like yeah. pay good, attention. Good question askers. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that does make sense. Very well, thank sexy. you, Mr. Carnegie. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so another thing that I think is going to really help you maintain the best peace of mind, even though it, of course, may seem counterintuitive at first. And this is both when like making a profile and when you're on a date with someone. And it can be summed up simply by just saying, take off the mask. And I know a lot of people say like, oh, yeah, be your true self or, or be honest or whatever. But it's like, really, this can be so tricky. Like, even when you head in with the intention of like, I'm going to be honest, I found like, even for myself, like it the tendency to want to try to make a good impression and to not scare someone off, it can really manifest in some very sneaky ways. Even if you really identify as like, Oh, I'm so honest. I'm an open book. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but like the choice to like tailor your language or to tailor the information that you give someone or to, or, you know, like it really takes, I think like a lot of self awareness and a lot of self critical awareness essentially to catch yourself at your own bullshit games (laughs) when you do go on a first date with someone. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, just kind of rededicating yourself to this idea of like, you know, actually being the best possible person that you can be, finding better ways to communicate who you are 
instead of trying to communicate what it is that you think this person wants to hear. Um, this is definitely something that we've talked a lot about on this show, particularly when it comes to dating while you're consensually non-monogamous, because that is just a territory that it's like, it's so rife with not wanting to scare someone off that it can be really easy to either downplay what your identity is, downplay how serious this is to you, downplay what your other relationships are like mm. in order to try to be less threatening, you know, or... make, yeah, to be less threatening essentially. Um, but it got, it just like, it always backfires. I've never not seen it backfire. I'm sure someone's going to email me and talk about how it worked out so fantastically for them. And like, sure, whatever you can email me or tweet at me. No, like, put that's it in fine. the, put um, it in the patron group. Let's talk about oh, it. Or put uh, it in the patron yeah. group. Like that's fine. However, I just like feel like in my work and in my personal, like, like I've never not seen it backfire in some way. And so, you know, that's why we encourage people to, you know, be quote unquote unapologetic and, also, even if you're not polyamorous, to just be normal unapologetic about who it is that you are. <laughs> yeah. And again, be just like so, so vigilant about the way that your own psyche is going to try to find these games to kind of try to protect you. Because that's essentially what it is. Um, and I've seen it go the other way too, where the games that people will play or that I've played to try to protect yourself is to make yourself seem much more negative than you are. Negative regarding what? Oh, interesting. Uh, of like, of like, super uh, self-deprecating kind of language uh, as this self-defense of I like, see. well, if I push them away, then they're not rejecting me because I did it for them. I scared them away intentionally. Mm. I've also that seen that and have experienced some of that myself. So it, it really like, I like how you put it of take off the <clears throat> mask and just focusing on like, how can I learn to better communicate who I am? rather than mm -hmm. one way or another trying to present a certain other thing take off right. the mask just reminds me of the movie face off oh see i was it was reminding <laughs> me of the mask i've been thinking of jim carrey this whole time yeah no i just saw a face off and I want man to take his face off. off yeah and they do goodness they do <laughs> um finally when you're on a date one should kind of focus less on checking all the boxes or on, on trying to figure out if this person checks all of your boxes, your proverbial <laughs> boxes. God, I can't just, today. Emily, I know, I know, I know. Mind in the gutter. No, but rather, yeah, just, to, you know, okay, are they marriage material or, or do they seem like they want kids or do they, you know, whatever it may be. Instead, like, try to focus on how you feel around this person. Do you feel good? Are you laughing? Do they have a great sense of humor? Like, what are the visceral reactions that your body is going through in the moment when you're speaking to them? Focus on those things as opposed to like, okay, I have to sit down and like, see if they're checking all of my boxes. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> to then decide if they can check your box. Yeah. Oh as my it were. goodness. The two of as you. As it were. I'm the so sorry. <laughs> we don't get to do this in drunk Bible study, so we have to do it here. That's true. We have to be so clean on that show, so yeah. proper and. Oh my god! You all have been saying okay. the f word all over the place. Because I, I got to get it out while I can. Well, exactly. So I, I am I getting pose in my a sex tricky jokes. question to the two of you yes. about this last point. Okay. What do you feel like? There's an easy way to tell a difference between when you're focused on like a checklist in a potential partner versus when you have boundaries around a potential new relationship. Hmm. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that, that is a good question. Cause, okay, because like, okay, mm -hmm. I think about the hypothetical situation sure. that I've been in a number of times where it's like, wow, I'm having a great time with this person. They're making me laugh. Or I feel attracted to them. Like, I feel great. But they've said to me pretty much straight out that like, I don't do polyamory. turns them off. Sure. <laughs> right. You know, or something like that. And so it's like, could you argue I need to let go of my checklist? Or could you argue that it's like, that's kind of a non-negotiable fundamental thing? Well, and is there an easy way to tell the difference? Because I, I think some people would have the same feelings around you. Yeah, they could have the same feelings around marriage or sure. cohabitation or having a child or whatever. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, if sure. If that is what you are looking for fundamentally, if you're like, okay, this is the the only people that I'm going to date from here on out are people who are interested in marriage or who are interested in having children or who are non-monogamous themselves, then yes, I think that those are things that you should look at. Ideally, maybe you'd talk about it in your profile already, or you'd go back and forth like and kind of put those hints out there, maybe especially regarding the non-monogamous one. 
I do think, mm. like you said, be as unapologetic as possible and like either put it in your profile or immediately when you message someone be like, and I'm interested in this thing or I am a practicing polyamorist. Right. I, I was going to throw out there. I, I don't, I mean, I just thought of this right now, but um, kind of the, the difference is I see a checklist as like a series of kind of positives that you think they need to have. Whereas a boundary is a little bit more of, um, I don't know how to phrase this, that it's more like, like your example of if someone says specifically they do not want to be non-monogamous, to me that's like, okay, that's a boundary because I know that that is something I want to do that I'm not willing to compromise on. Whereas a checklist thing would be like, they have a college degree mm. or they, you know, they have make a great a relationship with money. their mother. Right. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is, that's more of like luxuries, I guess. And then mm. I, I would maybe suggest, and I think this really depends and I could, I could see people arguing this, but like with the marriage and kids thing, I feel like the boundary version of that is like, if you really want to date monogamously and get married and have kids, that a boundary could be if someone says, I never want to get married or I never want to have kids. That could be a like, okay, I know that that's, mm. that is something I want, so this isn't going to work, so that falls under boundary. Whereas the checklist might be like, do they bring up marriage and kids on the first date or not? It, you know, or like, is that huh, something they're actively seeking? Do you, you know what I mean? Where it's more like, that's a, yeah. I, I don't know. And I could see that, I could see there being some gray area. Yeah. I just feel like people will kind of, if they really do some introspection, we'll see when it's like, I'm just trying to look for these things that I think will be good, or I have a certain superstition that they'll be good, or my mom once told me would be good, versus <laughs> something that's really like, mm, no, I can't do that kind of relationship. I don't know. Well, I'll be, I'll be honest. I feel like in the days when I was monogamously dating, I had a little bit more of the checklist mindset, because when you are dating, there's a little bit more pressure of like, if I'm going to be dating one person, they really got like, they literally do have to check all the boxes mm -hmm. essentially, or as many as possible. So I don't know. I feel like I felt more of that pressure when I was younger and maybe a little bit less now. I don't know. Mm. I'm not sure. That's an interesting really? thought. I'd like to hear what, what people think about that in the, yeah, definitely. In the discussion definitely. thread for this episode um, yeah. in the patron yeah. groups. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's talk about some general takeaways and some ways to maintain well being outside of when you're dating. Um, so I think, I don't know, the big thing that I feel like I've learned is this idea that like attraction in itself, it does grow and change not only in yourself as a human being over time, but also in a relationship. You know, it's not necessarily fixed from the first time that you meet someone. And often actually taking the time to sincerely get to know people will lead to a deeper attraction and better relationships. I think especially combined with this kind of self-critical analysis that we've talked about of analyzing the way your own attraction complex works. Um, anyway, kind of taking that more holistic approach is ultimately going to be better than continually just seeking the most attractive possible person yeah. in any given context. Right. And it's, it's definitely really easy to get burned out if you're just dating, 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 dating all over the place. Um, so it's really okay to take time for yourself and whether or not that's like time where you're just away from your dating app uh, or you just have some a good chunk of time between dates with multiple people. Um, Say so you have like 10 dates lined up, maybe take some time between those dates. Like don't just go bam, 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 because then you probably won't have a good, you know, it, a barometer for saying whether or not you really like a certain person or not. So yeah, take time for yourself. Be good to yourself. It's easy to get burned out and try not to do that. Yeah. So the, the closing thought that we wanted to leave everyone with about this is that just there's a lot of resources out there and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time or money on trying to game the system, trying to like play this game better and create the most quote effective profile, whether that means getting dates or getting responses to messages or getting people to message you, whatever it is. And ultimately, like maybe you make a profile that gets you more dates, but if those dates aren't actually like good dates, meeting people that make your life a better place, 
what are you doing? Like, what's the point of this? It's just taking more of your time and money. So instead of focusing on that, focus on actually just being the best person you can be and learn better ways to show that, to show who you actually are instead of what you think is the ideal or what you think is going to get you more dates or trying to like spin things to get more responses. And instead, just like be the best person you can be, just period, not in order to get more dates, but just because that's what you want to do. And then beyond that, just like try to be accurate. And so something I wanted to leave people with is if you do want to, in the patron group, for example, post a link to your profile and ask people for feedback or whatever, is, or if just asking your friends, is instead of saying, how could I make this better? which is usually what people ask, like, do you see anything wrong with it? Could I make it better? To instead, if it's someone who knows you, ask the question, do you think this accurately conveys me? Mm. Right? Like, does it show the type of sense of humor that I have? Or does it show the type of personality or the type of person I am? And if they're mm. like, well, no, it's you come across more <laughs> confident than you actually are. Mm. That's not a, like being it's better to be accurate i guess than to just come across in a way that you think might be more attractive um and then the second thing is if you are sending it to a group like in the patron group or something is instead of saying is like could i make this better to ask the question of like what kind of person do you think this profile shows and then Mm -hmm. based on the answers you get kind of evaluate like huh that's interesting everyone took away like that this person is very motivated or like career motivated. And if you're like, in reality, like I feel like I'm more about my relationships than my career. Mm. Huh. I didn't accurately portray who I am. Yeah. That's so that's, great. that's my right. challenge to all y'all. We want to know all of your trials and tribulations regarding the online dating world and your success stories. Um, what have you done to be more mindful in your online dating practices what has been challenging for you? We want to hear it all. So the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners and with us is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com, leave us a voicemail at 678-MULTI-05, or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Dedeker Winston, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I'm Dylan Thomas, co-host of Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. We share our experiences in swinging, polyamory, and beyond. You're listening to a Swing Set Network podcast at swingset.fm.